Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this fourth webinar of the dgnep.eu project that's titled Harnessing the Potential of Smart Technologies and Local Digital Twins for the New European Bauhaus. My name is Maria Giuffrida. I am a senior researcher at Trust IT, who is the technical coordinator of this project. And this project, of course, is a joint effort of a consortium of partners, which include not only Trust IT, but also Technical University of Delft as a financial coordinator, Industry Commons Foundation, uh, Innovawood, and uh, the European Association of Architectural Education. So I'm um, very happy to welcome you and introduce uh, this webinar. Uh, we have uh, the agenda, as you see in this slide, we'll start with some uh, you know, in introductory remarks from myself. I will explain you what we're gonna talk about and we'll also uh, give you a brief overview of DigiNEP as the uh, organizer of uh, this uh, webinar. Then we will have two presentations from um, uh, two projects that are uh, strictly connected to DigiNEP. Indeed, we call ourselves sister CSAs because we have uh, you know, synergistic objectives and target audience. And so we will hear from uh, Sophie Mezaros uh, representing the ds 4 SLCC project, uh, speaking right after me. And then we will hear from Gabriela Ruseva, who is a coordinator of Living in EU, uh, representing EuroCities. Uh, after this initial part of presentations of the three uh, projects, we will have a panel discussion on the main topic of the webinar. So we will see the perspective of um, experts on promising smart technologies and uh, local digital twin uh, examples that can be used uh, to support the sustainability of communities and to support the NEP movement in general. And so we'll uh, welcome here Marcos Noguera, coordinator of our rural project, Guillermo Ricciardi, a researcher at Politecnico di Torino, and uh, architect Cristina Labianca. Uh, we will also have some time for interaction and, uh, you know, to give you uh, the possibility to ask uh, questions to our speakers, and then we will conclude no later than 11.15. Uh, so this all will last roughly uh, one hour, one hour and 15 minutes. Um, so in this slide, we have we collected some statistics of who are the participants today. You see, we have more or less of the different types of actors that are involved in the new European Bauhaus movement. So we have uh, citizens, uh, um, we have researchers, we have architects, but we also have uh, decision makers in cities and we have designers, engineers, and people in construction industry, which are of course vital for, for NEB, but also for digital world, we have digital tech specialists. So it's a wide spread, uh, let's say community and audience. We don't have, uh, of course, the specific details of the each people that's registered or that's uh, present uh, today. So I encourage you, if you like and if you want, to use the chat anytime you prefer. Also to uh, simply introduce yourself. So feel free to do that. Say your name in the chat. What's your role? What you're working on? What are you know your interests? Uh, where you're connecting from? As you see here, we have registrants from uh, over 20 countries all across uh, Europe. Uh, but please say say hi in the chat and you know introduce yourself if you want and leave also maybe your social profile. So this, although this is a, a online event, we don't miss the opportunity to create some sort of networking. Okay, so feel free to do that anytime during the, uh, the meeting. Um, if you want uh, to keep up to date with the you know, history of DigiNeb and the past events that we have organized in this slide that will be shared after the event, you find uh, the direct link to the registrations of the first three webinars that we've already done. And you also find our social media and website uh, address so that you can enter our community, you can register on our website and you can exploit uh, DigiNeb opportunities that I'm gonna I present uh, uh, very, very shortly uh, right now. Uh, just a few notes for housekeeping uh, before starting with the content of the webinar. Uh, you should have uh, heard the message that the session is uh, recorded. This is uh, for us to allow everyone to see the event uh, 
uh, even after today. So if you don't agree with being uh, recorded and what you write being stored in the chat, just uh, feel free to, to, to leave. Uh, if you agree, then we are very pleased that you can stay. And as I said before, feel free to get engaged anytime using the Q&A function you should find in your you know, settings or writing directly in the chat or if you want to contribute later on during the panel discussion, just raise your hand and we'll give you the floor so that you can also comment via audio or video. We will also have a short interactive session uh, around 10.30 and we'll give instructions for, for joining that session and share uh, your opinion. So having said that, uh, just a few <clears throat> minutes uh, more to present Diginem to those who who don't know it already. As I said, it's a collective effort of a consortium of partners whose logo you see here in the slide. And as the name of the project suggests, we are, let's say, in the intersection of the digital and the new European Bauhaus communities. Actually, our mission is to create a pan-European digital ecosystem to support the new European Bauhaus initiative. Uh, which is an initiative that aims, uh, pushed by also the European Commission, that aims uh, to create living spaces that are more beautiful, more sustainable, and more uh, accessible, so more inclusive. And we try to reach this mission by uh, making uh, different type of communities uh, communicate. So by putting together digital solution uh, providers or creators with potential users of these solutions that can be various NAP actors. Uh, more precisely, we have the objective to map existing digital solutions, projects and tools that can be used for NAP purposes. We have the objective to create an active network, to create synergies with uh, other projects as the ones that we'll present today and other experts as the one that will uh, join our panel. Uh, we have the objective to produce uh, capacity building material. So we have trainings, courses, um, best practices, success stories to share and to you know, indicate uh, um, virtuous way to use digital technologies in NAB environments. And we have a final objective to, let's say, collect everything that we have learned in this journey uh, to deploy a NAB digital uh, roadmap. So a series of recommendations also for policymakers on what we think should be the strategy to make the NAB uh, movement become more digitalized and exploit digitalization at its full potential. In this slide, you see some numbers of you know, our community and our targets that we have in our project. This is a CSA lasting two years. We started in October 22 and we'll finish in September 24th. So we are in our 10th month of activities and we have, uh, let's say, a DigiNeb platform that's the core of our digital presence, DigiNeb.eu, that's made of four assets, a digital toolkit, a learning catalog, an observatory, and some thematic working groups, which are animated by early adopters and by a strategic external advisory group. And now I will tell you a little bit more about each of these assets, and then I will conclude my presentation. So what you can find in the DigiNeb activities, and if you visit uh, also right now our, our website, we, you will find, first of all, our toolkit, which is a catalog of more than 100 today, digital solutions that are categorized by type, by stakeholder that can be interest, and by other type of you know, characteristics that you can uh, use and you can explore and you maybe can contact the provider so that you can uh, learn how, how to exploit these solutions better. Then we have a catalog of over 20 success stories that narrate how a specific digital tool or solution has been used in a project, in a company, or by an individual person to receive some benefits uh, in their NAP-related work. We have thematic working groups that are discussing the best way, the, the landscape and the gaps, and the best way to deploy digitalization over the value chains in different sectors. We have one focused on architecture, one focused on design uh, and uh, others on uh, community and sustainability and on vertical industries. And then we have more recently launched uh, a training, uh, training platform with courses that are either uh, developed by us or available at external websites. 
So you can use these resources. You find the links uh, in, the, in the slide, and also my colleague Rita will put the direct links uh, in the chat. You can use this, and you can also become you know, a more active member, a more visible member in our community by applying to become an early adopter. Early adopters are you know, those members in our community that promote you know, their experience in, digital, uh, in the digital field. And today we will hear from some people that are actually uh, early adopters. We have more than 10 already published, and you can get there, be inspired, and also submit your application if you want to cooperate with us uh, more. Uh, that's all for my in, in, uh, initial introduction about DigiNeb. And uh, um, if you have any questions or comments, use the chat. I will now leave the floor to the first speaker, Sophie, uh, to uh, present her project. So uh, please, Sophie, the floor is yours. You can share the screen. Thank you. Let me just uh, share quickly. OK, can you hear me well? I see everything. Yes, now? yes, okay. we can. Thanks. Okay, so before we start off, I just want to apologize. Like usually I'm a lot more lively, but um, I have a slight food poisoning. So today I'm not at my best, but here I am to present you the data space for smart and sustainable cities and communities preparatory action. So uh, the short, the acronym for the data space project for this one is ds 4 sscc so you may have uh, come across this acronym already. This initiative is, uh, I would say, it's part of three environments. Uh, so the first one is, uh, is that it's actually a Digital Europe funded program. And uh, as such, it, uh, it lies actually in a, in a larger strategy. The idea is that uh, we should actually uh, enable digital transformation across cities and communities with a holistic roadmap. So the first stop is that we actually make the data available, hence the data spaces. And the second one is that we actually leverage on the existing data and we make uh, AI driven solutions. However, for those AI driven solutions to be safe and secure for Europe, they should first go through the testing and experimentation facilities which are also Digital Europe funded programs. Uh, so they are also sectorial. Uh, and as you can see, uh, uh, we actually are in close collaboration with the Sitcom AI TEF. The second one, uh, the second environment where we belong to is the landscape of all data spaces. About a year ago, so in autumn 2022, um, we were not the only preparatory action that kicked off. Uh, we kicked off with, alongside with other sectorial data spaces, uh, as well as uh, one cross sectorial, which is the Green Deal data space. And all of us have the same task to create the blueprint for our topic, for our theme. Now you can see that we have uh, on the bottom, we have Omega X DS4 skill. Uh, dates, tourism data space, and prep data space for mobility. These are all sectorial. So what makes us a, a little bit different is that we are cross-sectorial. We tap all, into all of these uh, sectors. Uh, and in this uh, wide web of uh, data spaces, there is a central node, uh, which is a data spaces support center. So if you are in general interested in data spaces, uh, you should turn to the data space support, support center because they are there to, to as their name um, may have given it away, provide support. Uh, the, the third one is that uh, we are actually also uh, part of the Living in EU community uh, because similar to DigiNab, we are also CSA. CSA to actually uh, support the movement of the Living in EU. A Living EU is uh, what uh, the Gabriela, the next speaker, will talk about. But just briefly, this is also a movement to enable digital transformation across Europe. Hence, uh, hence uh, the data spaces also are embedded into this environment because it's a nice platform to actually tap into an existing community as well as to disseminate knowledge. Uh, now, uh, I, I work with OASC and I'm coordinating the data space for smart and sustainable cities and communities on behalf of OASC. And with OASC, we are involved in, uh, in both of these projects. Um, so 
on the living in the way we you should imagine it that how the living in the EU actually uh, contributes to the data sys project is that we at OASC oversee the technical subgroup. So this means that in a technical subgroup, we are developing what we call the MIMS, the minimal interoperability mechanisms. And these MIMS are also a very important element of the data space itself. As you can see, this is an example of how we can actually uh, take that work that we do in the living in a new environment into the environment of the data space uh, for smart cities and communities is that we following the, the data space support uh, uh, advice also adopted the open DI framework. These are the, <clears throat> the building blocks of a data space. Or this has been elaborated upon since then, but at some point this was the, the, the take we had. And then we took this and we mapped the MIMS, the different kinds of minimal interoperability mechanisms onto them. Now I know that right now it's a bit far-fetched for you what minimal interoperability mechanisms may mean, but I invite you to, if you are interested in this, uh, I mean, I, I invite you to contact me or to look up uh, on the Living in the EU website or on the web, OASC website. Uh, so why do we have to actually talk about cities? Cities are actually in a very unique position because they can be both the providers and the consumers of uh, data and data-driven services. And uh, they are also, because they have such a central role in, the, in our society, they are they actually also, they also act, act as a catalyst for innovation. They have a really big uh, uh, buying power, for example. However, <clears throat> the problem is also that they, has, I'm sure as a lot of you are aware, there are a lot of silos in the smart city context and the community, and the data uh, that's in there is not necessarily portable and the silos are not uh, interoperable with each other. Now, data spaces actually have this, uh, offer this opportunity to overcome these silos, to break these silos, and to, to make uh, the processes more efficient and transparent as well. Here's an example that, for example, uh, we could take uh, tourism data with uh, mobility data to actually then optimize the transportation of, <clears throat> of a certain line, for example, in a city. So a little bit uh, about uh, like a little bit of information about the reality of the project right now. We are in the blueprint phase, which means that we are uh, creating the blueprint uh, of the data space, which is both which is both non-technical and technical elements. And uh, then in October, we have to actually submit it together with a roadmap for deployment. This will be followed with a with with a three-year deployment phase, uh, which I will talk about later. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the data space itself has uh, different uh, work packages which provide the technical and non-technical elements. But what makes it very unique or like what makes what feeds our work is a stakeholder forum. So the stakeholder forum has both uh, individuals from both the supply and demand side. And, um, and uh, we actually iterate with them to receive input or to validate uh, our findings or our propositions for the certain elements. Uh, we do this uh, via workshops, surveys, and interviews. And as I said, these, this community actually taps into the living in the EU community as well. Um, the, we have in total seven, uh, seven uh, workshops. We had to have the expression of interest form. We had surveys, we had interviews. So we had different ways of actually uh, like we applied actually different methodologies to to um, receive information and input from from people in the actual industry or like environment of data spaces. Uh, we also we look around we looked around Europe and we looked at the uh, data sharing cases, and so that we can actually have inspiration from that. Uh, what are the best practices out there that are already functioning, and also study them like maybe how can we improve them. So one of them is the optimizing tra traffic management to reduce pollu pollution. It's, uh, it's in Amsterdam and Lisbon. And the next one is management of energy flows in a city or community specific context. And this is led by Barcelona. And it's important that all of these use cases also align with the Green Deal objectives as we are striving to also support that. 
we have a lot more use cases and you will receive this uh, that we have shortlisted that we're actually really studying closely. You will receive this uh, presentation and then uh, you can study it more closely. We have, these are some of the questions that we ask in order to identify the different elements. I will not go into detail. You can also look at this uh, uh, when you receive the presentation, given that we are running low on time. And we just had our, our, um, our stakeholder forum workshop yesterday, and the next one is on the 6th of September. So if you would like to join, get in touch. I'm happy to add you. And then you can actually come at the best part of the project and see all the final products that we have delivered. Uh, if you visit our website, that's where you will actually have tangible materials. We will have a narrative document there <clears throat> about uh, how to actually um, approach the data spaces. We already have an online navigable catalog of specification. We will have a white paper for public. We will have capacity building exercises, and you can also sign up for our newsletter. We have some general announcements to make as well. So when I talked about the actual deployment phase, uh, we've been invited to prepare, prepare the deployment call. The, either way, the deployment will uh, kick off in October 2023, and it will call on cities and communities to become sites of piloting uh, in January. And then you will have uh, three months to apply. Uh, I would like to I would like to thank you for your attention, and if you have any questions, please let me know. Given uh, my state, I will go offline, but uh, I will just check the questions if there were any. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, you gave a lot of results and insights from the initiative. I think stakeholder forums are especially interesting also for indigenous purposes. So we'll be sure to, to promote the, the event also on our website. And uh, if you share with us also information on how other people can subscribe to the, to the forum, I think it's, uh, it's a great opportunity for all. Um, I don't see questions for uh, for Sophie in the chat, but she left. Uh, she left. Uh, we we have a thank you from Olivier, and uh, um, she left her contact in the in the slide. So maybe some question can come up also via email. Thank you for for presenting, and also given given your situation is uh, you know uh, even more uh, appreciated. So I would like to give you a virtual <laughs> round uh, of applause for, for your presentation. And uh, thanks a lot, Sophie. Uh, rest, rest well, and I uh, uh, hope you, you recover. And now uh, I will leave the floor to um, Gabriela. Um, if you're connected, right? Yes, I see you. Yes. Can you Welcome, hear me? Gabriela. Yes, the floor is yours, Great. so you can share your screen. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, um, really sorry to hear about uh, this, uh, Sophie, and I really wish you a very quick recovery. Um, as uh, it was already mentioned um, a few times, uh, I'm the coordinator of the uh, governance of the Living in EU project. Uh, it's also a CSA, uh, Coordination and Support Action, funded by the Digital Europe Program similarly to uh, DGNEP and to the DS for SSC, but uh, it uh, has a longer time frame. Um, it's a four year long project. We started also in October last year, uh, but we will continue until the end of September, 2026, and hopefully even beyond, uh, because we hope to prove uh, <laughs> that uh, this community is needed and that it's really uh, useful for the City, both for the cities, regions, and member states, or public authorities, which are members, as well as for the um, business, research, um, even civil society organizations, which constitute the supporters of this movement um, and which are also involved uh, in various ways. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Maria and Rita and all the DGNEP team for inviting us uh, to give uh, this um, update on what we've been up to for the last nine months and uh, what we are going to do and what we are planning in the pipeline for the next uh, few months. Uh, I will share my um, presentation. And of course, if anybody has any uh, questions, feel free to post them in the chat um, and even just to jump and 
after my presentation just to open your mic and speak freely. Uh, so what is this uh, animal, <laughs> let's call it like this, living in the EU? Uh, as I said, it's a project, but it's not only a project uh, because it started back in 2019 uh, as a political initiative of mayors mainly. Uh, it was supported also by the Finnish presidency of the European Union and was launched uh, during a big conference during the Finnish presidency. Uh, uh, also supported by Helsinki, Oulu, Tampere, and other big Finnish cities. Uh, and the idea was to uh, create uh, a network, create a community, create uh, the conditions for cities to uh, deploy and upscale existing digital solutions uh, to share, to collaborate, and uh, to uh, benefit from each other's um, advancement and achievement, because um, in many cases uh, there were very uh, good projects developing uh, very interesting uh, tools, uh, guidelines, uh, uh, but also even technology, uh, which um, then uh, was not uh, further exploited uh, beyond the project's uh, time frame. Uh, because uh, there was not, uh, let's say, this this field, this um, uh, this platform for collaboration and for exchange. Uh, so there was um, this intention uh, to create this network. Uh, it is for all European cities. So myself, I'm representing uh, Euro cities, uh, which is now in the lead of the project that supports this initiative. Um, which is the network of largest European cities, uh, but the, the initiative itself uh, is open to any uh, city of any size, any city. Gabriela, also... sorry, are you going on with the with the slides, or you're still in the first no, one? No, I'm in the first. Ah, slide. okay, just to make sure we we okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, no, um, uh, any city, but also any region and uh, member state. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to take a few minutes to uh, situate this uh, initiative uh, within the landscape of the activities, the policy um, actions of the European Commission, uh, the way that the European Commission works with the smart cities and communities. Uh, as you probably know, uh, the main interlocutor in this uh, topic is DigiConnect, and uh, they have uh, quite a few uh, actions uh, going on, uh, and uh, the Living in EU movement uh, is one of these actions, uh, which is aimed to facilitate, let's say, the whole uh, landscape. So it's a kind of a horizontal uh, platform uh, cutting through all the more vertical actions, uh, such as the one that Sophie described, which is the data space for smart communities. Um, they are also working on uh, local data platforms and especially on uh, ensuring interoperability of data and digital solutions. Um, also on local digital twins, uh, currently um, working on this uh, new instrument called the European Digital Infrastructure Consortium on local digital twins, which was announced very recently on the 15th of June at the Digital Assembly. And uh, also uh, the, let's say, financial support of all of this is uh, obviously the Digital Europe uh, program. So this is a little bit um, the bigger picture where living in EU is uh, situated. Uh, as I said, uh, it started back in 2019 as an uh, open initiative, uh, working at two levels, so political and technical. Uh, so as a first step, uh, the public authorities at local, regional and national level have to uh, commit to working in the European way to accelerate their digital transformation, which means uh, uh, based on interoperability principles, open data, putting citizens in the center, a citizen -led, uh, cities led uh, digital transformation. And uh, they do this uh, commitment by signing a political declaration, uh, which consists of uh, five principles. Uh, I will not go into the details of this because I can then go on and on for the rest of the webinar. Um, but um, so far we have a bit more than 150 uh, such cities, regions and member states. And I see in the participants in the chat already some cities such as uh, Fundao, Burgas, and Dublin, uh, 
which are already our signatories, uh, and but also some cities such as Ostend uh, in Belgium, which is not yet. Uh, and I just want to yeah, briefly <laughs> uh, mention that we, of course, invite uh, all the cities which are interested in working on digital transformation to join us. Um, then um, we would really like to be, so we have uh, two, let's say, main aims, uh, to be the safe space for cities and communities, so for public authorities to exchange on digital transformation, to exchange on their challenges, but also solutions, and we facilitate this. Uh, we ourselves, but also with the help of external experts when it's needed. For example, when we are discussing legal uh, issues, uh, we try to find an expertise uh, from, uh, from this sector. Uh, but on the other hand, our other aim is to bring together uh, all the, let's say, ecosystem stakeholders, uh, which we call supporters, which can be um, IT companies, um, uh, and uh, also research institutes, uh, even civil society organizations, which have a stake in this uh, digital transformation. Uh, yeah, as you can see, we have already members from all over Europe uh, <clears throat> and uh, supporters um, are categorized uh, according to the, the type of organization. So we have many uh, companies um, working on, on data, on technologies, on um, software solutions uh, for uh, data management, uh, data governance, uh, intermediaries. I mean, they are really a very uh, vast, um, let's say, spectrum of, of type of uh, organizations. And what is uh, common is that uh, they are united by the principles of our declaration and the values uh, that we promote. Um, so what are these principles? Uh, we really want to make sure that every city and community can benefit uh, from the green and digital transformation. Uh, and we do that by supporting the cities and communities to develop, reuse and share digital solutions so, so that they don't have to reinvent uh, the wheel uh, every time. Uh, well, very briefly, I mean, what's in for the local level as a, as a, as a network, as a, as a platform, we provide, of course, access to information, funding and tools, uh, uh, connection to uh, uh, an ecosystem of uh, organizations that share the same challenges and the same objectives, uh, some practical guidance and, of course, enhanced uh, visibility. And cities can take a very, uh, or regions. I mean, uh, in this case, when I talk about cities, I really mean all level of public um, administration of governance uh, can become, can take a very active role and become uh, also chair of one of our five subgroups. Um, as I said, we work uh, across uh, five, let's say, um, let's call them aspects of digital transformation because they are not really thematic areas. They are rather, um, addressing digital transformation from different uh, aspects. And uh, because of this also requires the involvement of different uh, experts from the city. Uh, so usually we have uh, one, um, let's say, person who is um, following and coordinating uh, the work, but also in each of the respective meetings, uh, we try to involve uh, the, the experts which are working in the legal department, in the financial department, in the technical department, um, and so on. So concretely, uh, what do we do and what we have been doing uh, so far? Uh, in the technical uh, working group, uh, we work uh, mostly on the minimal interoperable mechanisms, uh, which also Sophie briefly mentioned, and they are uh, now in their version six, and uh, our colleagues from OASC are leading this work, uh, and they involve uh, cities in the definition of these uh, standards. These are uh, minimal standards for interoperability of digital solutions. Uh, which then ensure that um, the possibility of uh, exchanging data, uh, the possibility of reusing a solution in another context. Um, and they are, um, I mean, this is very technical work. I'm also not really uh, an expert on this, but there are six of these standards and uh, some of them are um, more, let's say, developed than others, uh, but they are the opportunity for cities to also um, 
push for the standards that they are using to become uh, standards uh, that are promoted by living in EU and uh, in this way to also ensure that the digital solutions uh, that they are using are interoperable. Uh, so that's why it's interesting for cities to participate in this work because it's really co-creation, it's not imposing the standards uh, top down. And also for companies, of course, it's interesting uh, to make sure that the solutions that they produce, uh, especially that are off the shelf, are um, interoperable and compliant with these standards. Uh, then we are working also uh, from the legal perspective on, um, for example, um, looking at uh, European legislative acts, such, such as the Interoperable Europe Act, the, the AI Act that is currently being uh, still negotiated, the Data Act, and um, with the help of legal experts uh, trying to explain and uh, understand together with the cities what are the implications uh, of this uh, legislation uh, at their level. Because, um, I mean, once they are uh, approved and adopted by the member states in a few years, they will become the norm. And uh, yeah, it's better that the cities are already prepared uh, for what's coming. Uh, we also work on concrete tools uh, such as the FAIR AI standard procurement clauses, which you see here, uh, which are um, yeah, standard contract clauses, what, what, it, <laughs> what it is, um, that cities can use when they are procuring digital solutions, uh, including uh, artificial intelligence. Um, many other tools that I will just briefly mention, uh, a few more, uh, such as the Lordi Mass tool, which is an uh, self-assessment tool of digital maturity, essentially a survey that uh, cities can um, complete in order to understand where they are at their digital uh, transformation in uh, seven areas, such as interoperability, data governance, uh, citizen centricity, and so on. Uh, and this can be the first uh, step of um, also participating in different projects and also uh, let's say, justifying different needs. So you can show that, okay, my city uh, scored this in this field. So we need, that's why we need to improve and that's why we need to be uh, part of this or that project. Um, there is also capacity building, a number of resources, uh, and uh, we also work on the financial aspects. And this year in the focus of our work uh, in the financing uh, working group uh, are, as I said, this. Uh, new European uh, instrument proposed by the European Commission, this uh, European Digital Infrastructure Consortium. And uh, especially there is going to be one on, because there are different such consortiums in different uh, uh, fields, different topics. And there's going to be one on uh, local digital twins. Um, I don't know, Maria, uh, how much time do I have? Uh, shall I? Uh, yes, Gabriela, uh, uh, if you could give your concluding yeah. remarks, it okay. could be. Great, thanks. Uh, okay, so yeah, uh, just a few things to keep an eye on. Uh, I was already mentioning them, but uh, this uh, Lordi Mass Assessment Instrument will be launched in October in all uh, EU languages. So uh, stay tuned, uh, if you, especially if you are a city um, or a region. Uh, the, the new version of the MIMS uh, minimal interoperable mechanisms will be published by the middle of July, so in about a week, uh, and will be public. Uh, and it will be uh, then uh, further, uh, I mean, it's a constant process of updating these uh, standards because of course also uh, digital technology update, uh, I mean, uh, is uh, updated um, every day and uh, we really try to keep um, well, uh, the pace of these uh, developments uh, with the standards. Uh, so in September, we'll start a new process for uh, again, uh, uh, reviewing these uh, standards together with cities and companies involvement. And there is an open call on uh, participating in the uh, working groups on each of these standards. So if you are interested in this, you can contact either me or, or Sophie because she uh, always uh, also involved in this uh, to express your interest. Uh, and then uh, more information to come also on this uh, European Digital Infrastructure Consortium uh, from September onwards. Uh, there is a very easy way to, to join the movement, either if, if you are a public authority, either signing the declaration, or if you are a private sector representative or civil society or research uh, 
uh, institutional representative to support the declaration on our uh, website. And of course, I invite you to follow us on social media and happy to, to connect with you there. Uh, these are the five networks uh, which are involved in the project, uh, OASC, uh, ENOL, uh, CMR, ERIN, and EuroCities, and we are always happy to hear from any uh, feedback uh, from you. So thank you for your attention uh, and uh, looking forward to the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriela, for your presentation. I already saw you mentioned very interesting solutions that I think could also be uh, showed, showcased in the DigiNeb uh, catalog. So we will reach out to you <laughs> to ask you to, to do that. And also people in the chat suggest their role as digital providers. So yeah, we have given indications uh, to, to share their solution with us. So we give them more visibility. Uh, so Gabriela will stay with us until the end of the webinar. So if anyone has a, a question for her, you can use the chat or the Q&A box. And now we pass to, let's say, the second uh, session of, of the webinar, that's a panel discussion. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. I see Marcos Noguera already uh, that joined us, uh, is the coordinator of Auroral. Welcome, Marcos. Thank you. Hello, hello, can you hear us? Yes, yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, no, not totally fine, but yeah, we can we can uh, hear you. Uh, then Cristina Labianca, uh, architect. Hi, everybody. Welcome. And then Guglielmo Ricciardi, researcher of Politecnico di, di Torino. Welcome, welcome, Guglielmo. Thank you. Okay, so we would like to start a, a discussion with our three speakers and also Gabriela, if you want to join the discussion later, feel free, uh, with some questions. And the first question is actually for every one of you. Uh, so I ask uh, Rita's support to share the instructions on how to uh, join us. So you have to go, you have to read uh, in the upper part of the slide, go on menti.com. Uh, you can do so on your mobile phone or you can do so in desktop. Use the code that you see in the slide, 85355369, and answer this you know, ice-breaking question. That is, which of the following benefits of smart technologies do you believe is most impactful for creating sustainable and resilient communities? Of course, there is no correct answer and you can also provide more than one. Uh, answer if you want, but it's just to see if there is, you know, any any convergence on a benefit that is more evident or you know more easy to reach, etc. So we see some votes coming in already. I'll give you a few minutes to to connect. and provide your answer. I don't see how many already responded. Yeah, but votes are coming in because I see the ranking, the ranking moving. So we have so far enhanced quality of life and citizen well-being as uh, an important type of impact that smart technologies, digital twins, etc., can enable. Increased safety and security measures is you know, more uh, lacking at the moment, and the others, uh, the others uh, come uh, a second and third improved efficiency and streamlined infrastructure and resource uh, infrastructure and services. Uh, not sure if anyone, maybe only a few uh, of you, uh, selected other. In case you wish to suggest uh, uh, other type of benefits that you think smart technologies can bring uh, for smart communities, or that can you know should be considered, uh, then answer the following question: to please name other benefits, if any. And while we wait for your other benefits to come in. I would like to ask our panelists to give their view, okay, so their opinion on this very first question. So which benefits do you see 
do you see as important uh, benefits of smart technologies for sustainable communities? And I'd like to start with uh, Marcos. So Marcos, you can uh, mute yourself and give, you, give us your uh, point of view. Can you hear me, Marcus? Okay. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, sorry, uh, it took a bit to to find. I'm I'm speaking from a hotel room, so not all the connection will be perfect, but I hope it works because that's big big pleasure to be with you. I'm first fan of Digital Neb project, as you all know. We are quite in touch, and that's that's amazing work the one you have been doing. And that's absolutely kind from you to organize this uh, webinar. Um, to make us talk, to change ideas, of course, it would be much better if by some reason we could meet in person. I hope we can do it soon somewhere. Uh, that's always a pleasure to see again our colleagues from uh, OASC and, uh, and uh, the other network uh, cities. Nevertheless, it's a very good initiative from DigiNab. So thank you for that and, and really that's really brilliant everything you are doing uh i have to introduce a little bit myself i think but yes yes quick. sure okay. sure please let's introduce just, yourself I, I will do it quickly i'm marcos nogueira i'm portuguese i'm based in brussels so i am one of those guys operating from the bubble the european bubble of brussels here we, what I do regarding these matters of smart communities, smart cities, that's indeed a topic I worked for a long time. Before that, I was a modeler. Modeling is what now we call digital twins, but it started long ago. It was indeed the revolution for all the engineering, all the capability and possibility of optimizing. It was done with modeling. So uh, modeling was a mix from uh, artificial intelligence and physically based model. As we all know, artificial intelligence web operates well replicating what is known, but doesn't work well when we go to the unknown. When we need to predict something that's really, that's really first time to happen, for instance, climate change, was it predicted by artificial intelligence? It was predicted by modeling. And of course, we may know about weather from artificial intelligence. So if we think about weather, where we are repeating patterns, artificial intelligence is good. When we think about things that are evolving in the future in a certain direction, in a certain transition, we need models. So that's that combination that makes possible to do prediction, simulation, training, the virtual sandbox, and so on, so on, so on. That's fine to name it digital twin. It's a little bit reductive. So that's why the reason that's the point I'm making. So that's my background. I'm a modeler and uh, I'm now involved in, uh, in a very big operation. So I'm coordinator of H 2020 Aurora. Aurora is a, is a quite a large consortium. So I, I'm very pleased that uh, Mrs. Gabriela uh, in the presentation before, just presented the, the partners of uh, Living in You, and uh, some of those partners are from our project, uh, many of the supporters. Indeed, of uh, as a result, that the European Commission asked us to massively adhere to, to Living in You, so we did. So that's, uh, I'm happy that the network is developing and getting some uh, some capability of contributing indeed to this, uh, to, to all this uh, ecosystem to thrive. So my job is taking care of Aurora, is driving Aurora, is coordinating Aurora. Aurora is, uh, as I said, is a consortium. Within that consortium, there are many activities. We did, for instance, a beautiful project on, on uh, bringing to, to rural people the digital competencies for, for media and uh, and that was amazing success, so everybody was happy. Indeed, it was an extremely interesting opportunity to bring to the to bring to to bring back to the community the ones that actually built the community. So the more ad, elderly ones, the ones that paid taxes for 60 years and now are a bit excluded from the transformation. So that that was a wonderful project. This part of our, our consortium and there are many things we do we are very active on the 
on the spot or the area of infrastructure and, uh, and in good cooperation with the European Commission. That's indeed very important. That's important we manage infrastructure in a very wise way because digital infrastructure is not the same as road infrastructure. So that's that's important to keep it within the scope of governance that also has to be to be developed according to the standards of participation, inclusion, inclusion and uh, and uh, and uh, cooperation, co co collaboration that we need to see developing among the, among our citizens. There is a very important thing about Aurora. I, I have to say the two things on Aurora that are interesting. First one. In Aurora, we, we believe in, in freedom, so it's a very free consortium. This is very interesting to, to note. That free consortium, I say it because it's, uh, it's indeed an opportunity to see that freedom works. Everybody is free to, 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 to bring ideas, to innovate, to propose, to suggest, to take the initiative. They are free to criticize the coordinator, of course, but they do. Well, not often, but yeah, it may happen. And that freedom, that freedom is really very, very important as it makes things to, to, to work on a horizontal basis where everyone may participate. So I'm very, very glad to follow policies from the European Commission, but uh, top down doesn't work as such. Of course, those uh, initiatives and policies from the European Commission, when they work is because they were op open to the community and they were indeed having this bottom up and transversal horizontal capability of proposing, suggesting and indeed indeed working together. That's very important to address issues globally because for instance, Aurora is very committed to, the, to participate on the global standards of so the IEEE and the, the ISO. That's the standards are a sensitive thing, so that's that's something we have to address carefully in order to prevent ourselves to get isolated. So when we work on standards, we have to do it the European way, but indeed at a global level. That those are not standards for procurement only, as it may be the case of those minimum interoperability for solutions out of the shelf. The problem is when the shelf is empty. And that's, that's what we address in Aurora. So it's co-developing the solutions when the shelf is open. It's, it's, it's when the shelf is, is, uh, is empty. The co-development and shared development, it's a very important feature. Let's yeah. work with, let's start with shared development. Shared development is a very, very old idea. It started in the 80s in Chicago when people uh, studying economics just uh, came out with the idea that is much better when uh, private investment in priorities and public priorities, for instance, for regional strategy and development are well organized and that is done within, within an environment of shared development. That is sometimes happening and that's sometimes not happening. When it doesn't happen, we find the weird things like innovation trap that, for instance, Commissioner Ferreira is so many times pointing to. And that's when the shelf is empty. That's when we have to create the mechanisms to co-develop and we have to do it within the, the environment of shared development. That's very Thanks. much what we, what we try to do with Aurora. Yeah. is to create that ecosystemic environment for co-development. Why do you, why did, why do we do so? I would say just to shorten the answer because I care about European digital sovereignty. And, and we, we know we have a problem when it comes to the digital because when the shelf is not empty, main, most of the products are not Europeans. And that is a problem. So we have a, we have a deficit of offer. We have a good very good instrument that's the single market is there for 30 years, single market is working, but that's a good buyer and we have to be a good developer. It's very important for digital sovereignty that, to, that Europe really comes out with solutions that have to be collaborative, cooperative, co-developed and those solutions are good to, empty, to, to, to solve the empty shelf problem. And those, those co-development uh, mechanisms actually need, require and demand 
to have the proper digital environment with secure interoperability. Please never try to do digital intelligence, artificial intelligence based on data sets that are not secured. It's going to be disastrous. Please don't do artificial intelligence based on data sets that are not clean, that are not ethical, and that are not compliant. And that compliance, that need of interoperability and providing a certain digital secure digital environment with secure interoperability tools is absolutely defining in order to make possible in the future to have digital twins operating together, sharing that, and so generating artificial intelligence tools. If we don't yeah. talk about artificial, sorry, if we don't talk about digital twins and we begin talking about creativeness, co-development, interoperability, it's even more important. And you in Digital Neb, you talk a lot about culture, about heritage, about hearts. I love it. That's why we feel uh, that's why I feel so much attached to what you do, because indeed it is not beautiful if it is not done together with people. And to be to do it together from everywhere we are, from all our different backgrounds, for from all our all our diversity, which is very much the European way of doing so. Again, affirming European autonomy and European and European sovereignty. If Thanks, Marcus. Have those, uh, if, I have it's just just ending. If if we don't have that interoperability environment, it's very difficult to co-create. And so all the process of a new European Bauhaus that you were developing is less thriving. So that's these are our priorities very quickly within Aurora that I'm very glad to share here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos. Actually, you mentioned a lot of topics in your reply, in your presentation of, of our role. Some of them actually of, of our benefits of technology, such as the standards and the co-creation and, you know, uh, shared approach. Now I would like to uh, move to the other speakers. We have around 15 minutes left for, for the event. So I would like to ask to Guglielmo to comment a little bit on the benefits you see in the slide and add if you have any. And I ask you two questions in one, so we save a little bit of time. So while you comment on benefit, also if you can tell us if you have any examples based on your researchers or based on your research publication, etc., any concrete examples that you can share about this benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I'm very glad to participate on, uh, with, the, with this debate. And um, as, um, as a researcher in the field of urban planning, urban design, uh, climate change, and uh, uh, digital technologies, I think that uh, uh, all of these uh, uh, potentials and, and benefits of smart technologies to uh, support the increase uh, uh, of the level of resilience in, in community are important. There, uh, there is no one that is more important than, than others. And um, I think, for example, in my experience, uh, uh, for example, improved resource efficiency and conservation is uh, a, a potential, uh, a very big potential for uh, uh, public administration and local communities, uh, for example, in circular economy, uh, field to uh, we we as we can see in many European uh, projects, for example, uh, BAMB projects or uh, uh, other type of uh, uh, digital applications such as Madaster as a digital platform. Uh, through digital technologies, we can uh, collect and map some data related to uh, find. Uh, uh, construction materials uh, in the cities uh, that could uh, uh, reuse or recycle uh, with the, in, in another context. And for example, in circular economy uh, field, it, it is very important. At the same time, um, enhancing quality of life and citizen well-being and increased safety and security measures uh, are add, um, are. <clears throat> Uh, very important uh, benefits, uh, for example, uh, uh, through uh, uh, early warning system in the field of uh, uh, climate change adaptation. Uh, there is a very interesting application uh, developed by Digital Twin Hub in the UK, 
uh, that is the climate resilience demonstrator that is a pioneering uh, uh, climate change adaptation digital uh, platform that could uh, uh, prove the collection of uh, uh, data uh, coming from different uh, sources uh, uh, could uh, support uh, the decision making the control uh, and then functioning of critical infrastructures uh, during uh, extreme climate events such as uh, heat waves or, or flooding and uh, this type of uh, technology could save uh, more lives and uh, uh, and save injuries i think that all of these are uh, are important there is no one better than than others and all are uh, uh, in in the way to uh, better increase the level of resilience of the uh, local community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guillermo, for your insights. And I would like to hear the opinion on the same topic, also from, from Christina. So based on your experience and also the projects you're working on, uh, what benefits do you see from digital technologies? What you see as more promising? Um, and please, the floor is yours. Yes, hi Maria, hi everybody. Uh, just a, a short introduction. <clears throat> I'm uh, Christina Labianca, I'm an architect, and my work mainly focuses on sustainable architecture, regenerative urbanism, and social impact design. Um, it, it is really interesting the topic that we are discussing today, and I have to say that I'm completely aligned with Guglielmo and Mr. Marcos about the topic of collaboration. And I agree with Guglielmo to say that all these kind of new technologies applying to study cities are fundamental um, tools to analyze the reality. I think that sustainability it's a uh, um, holistic uh, topic that we have to, to study together. So starting from the physics, for example, social economics or environmental topics uh, uh, that has to be studied all together. So I really believe that um, using new technologies to analyze cities is a really important tool to understand the need of the cities because every cities are different one to each other. And starting from the climate, from the population, from the culture, from um, the um, urban environment, from the taxonomy of the city. So every city are different and we cannot try to, to have one solution for every city in the world. So using this kind of new technologies allowed us to have an overview, a specific overview in every city analysis and cross-matching all the data about, for example, the climate is fundamental to have a data about the climate and climate risk in every single cities, but also, but also that uh, can talk about uh, um, people happiness and beauty of cities or and opportunities to beautify, to make to make uh, um, people green in a city greener and also this kind of uh, technology can allow us to create partnership in between uh, stakeholders of the cities, like starting from citizens, for example, uh, business environment, uh, academia, a uh, government to work together towards achieving, you know, the sustainable development goals and the, the, the bigger um, goal to, to reach uh, net zero cities by 2050. So I really believe that, um, I'm, I, and I agree also with Marco says that we, we cannot base only on data sets, uh, but of course it's a tool that nowadays is important for us to study the realities, but then we have to use empathy and we have to engage people and we have to use intellect in maintaining the city's um, ecosystem uh, for prosperity and for um, and to make it uh, cities greener. Thanks, thanks, uh, Christina. I see uh, your position yeah, very much uh, aligned with the other speakers. As we are approaching the end of the webinar, we have like five, 10 minutes left. I would like first to encourage people that are still connected, thank you, to share any other insights or additional comments they have on this topic. And I would like to have a final uh, round of question again uh, with you all, and maybe we revert the order. So we start from Christina again, and we go back to Guillermo and then Marcos to share in just one minute, 
uh, what you think, talking about the future, okay, so next steps, what do you think can be, you know, the biggest promise or the, you know, most important and potential trend from a technological point of view or also other, uh, you know, uh, other dimensions that you see as a great enabler for sustainability uh, for smart communities and for NEP. So what you yeah, are, what you would bet on for the next uh, future. So Christina, uh, first to you, uh, key trends that you see, and then- Yeah, I'm trying process. to be, yeah, I'm trying to be really uh, short. Um, I'm actually working and trying to explore AI urbanism, actually, because I think that can be a, a really a revolution to urban planning because it's a, it's a way to quickly analyze the reality using data and then also create some um, um, potential solutions to analyze and to, to solve the city's problem and then connecting people and uh, resources for example to announce uh, projects in, in in cities so I really believe that uh, AI can help uh, urban planning and help decision making and then also helping the engagement of citizens and uh, collaborate all together. Thanks, Christina. What about Guglielmo? Do you agree with Christina or you, do you see something more different? No, quite, quite uh, common points. For example, from my side, uh, I think that for me, uh, in particular as a, as a researcher, I'm exploring the role of digital twin. I've recently published an article uh, uh, on the exploration of digital urban digital twin uh, development in, uh, in the European context. And uh, I think that it's a, a good and right uh, tool to support urban uh, decision makers uh, uh, to a more rapid uh, local climate action to increase the resilience uh, of local communities. And, uh, but I think that in terms of uh, um, digital technologies, uh, two big challenge, challenges are arising. And, and uh, these two are uh, from my side, the first one, the privacy and data uh, protection as, uh, as Marcos said before, uh, because uh, we can uh, take, uh, many data coming from IoT, from different uh, sources that are vulnerable uh, to uh, sharing with in, in, a, in a public way. And uh, at the same time, the second one point for me is the interoperability. In this way, for example, in the digital, way, digital twin context, as uh, also as uh, Gabriela said before, uh, different digital technologies plays a key role to develop a digital twin. IoT as a sensor to uh, collect some data, uh, artificial in intelligence and machine learning to uh, calculate, to automatize such uh, processes and to uh, more rapid uh, understanding of the behavior of the, of the city, for example or uh, also the interoper interoperability with the augmented and virtual reality to, uh, for example, engage citizens in a, uh, more virtual experiences to uh, show, for example, uh, how the city will, will change in the future, in the future for, the, uh, for the local climate action and for the impacts of climate change in particular. I think that uh, this these two challenges are uh, are fundamental in, in the future to take into account when we work with uh, these tools. Thanks, Guillermo. Totally, totally agree. And so, last but not least, Marcus, again to you in uh, last one minute of, of the event. If you have any other thoughts or comments to add to the discussion, thanks. Maria, thank you. I was trying to follow the keywords and to make a wrap up on one minute, I think I would use two. And one, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's on one hand, it's a joke. On the other hand, it's very, very important thing to keep in mind is that uh, we have smart cities and communities. That's the way we name it. But indeed, communities are the human face of smart cities. We could do smart cities with 
lots of sensors, IoT, traffic lights going on and, uh, and other automated things and no people around. But you can't do communities without people. And that's where things start. So let's keep in mind that there is a distinction, a div, div, actually very clear distinction to do between smart cities and communities. And we are the human face of smart cities and communities. We are the smart communities. Or are always about smart communities. The second point I'd like to make is if you ask me, uh, it was not asking me, it was asking everyone, but I felt the question a little bit personally because it's something we care very lot we care a lot about it's it's indeed if you ask me one single question in terms of concern for the future in one single word i will say the word the word is democracy we have to use these instruments artificial intelligence automation extended reality everything creativeness beautifulness etc in order to in reinforce in order to renew refresh and uh, and uh, and protect our democracy we are talking about people when we talk about smart communities i used one of the examples from aurora indeed working with elderly populations in rural areas in order to make them to be part of the transition that's reinforcing democracy it's not leaving people behind and that has to be done all across Europe with all the contributions and uh, in the process that we are all respected and, uh, and indeed considered and integrated. That's why I liked Christine and, and Guilherme so much what you said, because that's very much true. So if you ask me the word for the future, for all of us to care, to work together and to, and to co-create in order to reinforce it, the word is democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcos, also because you facilitated my job in wrapping up with your, with your comment and summarizing your main uh, highlights that came out from, from the panel. I see also some comments uh, in the chat. We'll save the chat, okay, so that uh, we can also address uh, questions in the, in the next uh, days. Um, I have no more to say actually to you, just a final invite again to all the speakers. To, to visit the websites of all the projects that have been presented. So DGNEB, ds 4 scc Living in EU, uh, and Auroral, and explore the opportunities. And especially from the DGNEB, DGNEB point of view, there are opportunities to become early adopters, to share your solutions, uh, to use the solutions or to share success stories. So feel free to, to do that. Rita will copy the links uh, once again in the chat. Thank you very much, everyone, the speakers and the audience for attending, although it's almost a summer Maria. holiday. Yes, can, Marcos. Maria, can I, can I use 10 seconds for an announcement? Yes, you can, yes. From, from, Octo seconds. from October the 1st, we are going to have open calls. Okay, so great. We are, going to, we are going to pay to innovators to connect, to, uh, to, to, to work within our digital environment in order to validate it. So that's a great opportunity for a lot of people. That's only the announcement. Just keep in touch. Pay attention to the open calls from October the 1st. That's amazing. We will help you circulate this message, Marcos. And uh, thanks again, everyone. Have a good uh, rest of the day and see you in the next uh, uh, event. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, Goodbye. Thank you. And thank you also to the DigiNeb team who supported Rita and Claudio and the other partners of um of the project uh, that supported us thank you so much bye 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 thank you bye bye